Welcome to The Connecting Point. Front. Come on, kids. I'm glad all three of you missed me. Y'all awake this morning? Golly. Wake up. Wake up. Well, it's good to see you kids. Um, I brought something I want to show, with, show to you today, and um, some, as I was bringing it in, some folks already recognize this, and maybe most of you probably know what this is, right? Everybody know what this is? It's a tiny Bible. We call it the Gideon Bible. And the Gideons um, give these out to people. Um, if you've ever been in a hospital, if you've ever been in a hotel, It's worth more to me than just about anything. And uh, because of April 8th in 1998, none of you were around then. Okay? That was a really, really, really rough time. And uh, my little town that we were living in, in Alabama, was hit by an F5 tornado. And uh, the little town next that down the street from us um, was literally destroyed. 30-something people were killed in this small town. There was one road in and one road out of the town. And uh, our church, we were I was a youth pastor at that time, and our church got together and uh, got some men and women, and uh, we went down there the night. It was still raining. And we went down there that night and cut uh, tree limbs off of the road just to let the ambulances come by to get help the people. Um, we were helping people all the way around, and... Uh, um, I'll never forget helping clean clean up the next day. And uh, I found this Bible within the, the rubble. This Bible has literally been through a tornado. And uh, the weird thing about this Bible is that I found this Bible in a yard of a, in a home uh, 30 miles away. Um, so this Bible literally was picked up by the tornado and placed in this, in this front yard. And I picked it up and couldn't find the owner and anyway, decided just to keep it. And uh, so, uh, it always a reminder though. And let me tell you why I got this. Let me tell you why. Because the Bible says of itself, the flowers fade and the grass withers, but the word of God stands forever. Yeah, even through a tornado, the word of God stands and this is always a constant reminder. It reminds me of two things. Let me tell you this, and I want, to, I want to give you this. It reminds me of two things, that the Word of God stands forever, and number two, that He is with us in the midst of the storm. And, and this is a reminder of that. So I want you to think about it the next time that you uh, open your Bible, the next time that you uh, do a Bible study. Um, we've all got Bibles laying around the house. There's tons of them laying around the church. We've got Bibles, and we kind of take the Word of God for granted. We, we kind of forget that um, there's a lot of people that went through a lot of things, and a lot of people lost their lives just so that we could have the opportunity uh, to read this book. So, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of God lasts forever. So, I want, you to, I want to challenge you with that, okay? Let's have a word of prayer this morning. Father, we just come before you, Lord. We just thank you for your Word. We thank you that your you hear a uh, song like that um, it reminds us that even in a world that seems to be coming apart at the seams it's still the cross isn't it it is still the cross it's the cross of Christ um, we are finishing up our sermon series uh, message series actually our uh, uh, look our journey through Romans chapter 12 so hopefully if you've got a copy of God's Word you will turn to Romans chapter 12 we're going to finish up the chapter today and we're going to finish up a series called living life on purpose um, several years ago during the Korean War our soldiers befriended a little Korean boy and that Korean boy just took to those soldiers. He followed them everywhere. 
He just loved those American soldiers. So the American soldiers just basically put him in charge of cooking. He, was, he cooked, he cleaned, he just did all kinds of odd and end. Well, just as you would know anything about military guys, they've always got something up their sleeve. And so they played pranks on this little boy. I mean, they would put Vaseline underneath a stove handle, and he'd put his hand under there and get it all over him. They'd put buckets of water behind the door, and he opened it up and whoosh, all over him. They'd nail his shoes to the floor. They'd do all kinds of little funny things, but this little boy just wasn't... I mean, his, he, you could tell his face, just in his face, he just didn't much care, I don't think, for the practical jokes, because he just had a, a blank stare. So finally... These soldiers got together and they said, you know what, this is just not fair. A little conviction throwing in their heart and said, you know what, we're not going to do this anymore, this little boy. So they sat the little boy down and they said, come here. And he said, yes. And they sat him down. And they said, look, said, uh, we're sorry that we've been picking on you and that you've been the butt of our jokes and pranks. From now on, we're not going to do that anymore to you. And he said, uh-huh. And they said, no more. And he said, no more Vaseline under stove. No more Vaseline under stove. No, 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 more door, no more water over door. No more water over door. No more. No more nailing my shoes. No more nailing shoes to the floor. No more nailing shoes to the floor. I promise you. The boy smiled and he said, Then no more spit in soup. <laughs> okay, now, I said that to say this. In our life, we want revenge, don't we? We want revenge. And the title of the message this morning is Loving Those Who You'd Rather Hate. Now, you know, we talked about last week, and, and hopefully you were here last week, and if you didn't, just kind of jump in and hold on. But we're in Romans chapter 12, and, and like I said, we've just been looking through and studying this book great book of Romans but the 12th chapter of Romans is a is a dynamic chapter because what it does is it talks to us about how to live out practically what Paul has put into place from Romans chapter 1 through Romans chapter 11 and last week we were in verse 14 and I want to know if you remember the verse of Scripture how many of you Remember the verse of Scripture that we quoted last week, all three of you. Great. I'm glad that you remembered that. Let's try it together. Remember, let's do it. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Good job. Some of you just kind of gave me the, the mouthing off so that you would think I would know. Um, I'll never forget one day I was preaching and... Uh, Somebody was in the back, come up after church, and, and I said, hey, I said, uh, late night last night? And they said, what do you mean? I said, yeah, I just kind of saw you nodding off there, either that or he was trying to peck the ground like a chicken. And um, I said, uh, he said, you could see me? And I said, let me, add, let me tell you something. If you can see me, <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> Folks, if you can see me, I can see you, all right? So, but here's what's a great thing about Romans chapter 12 and verse 14. We talked about that last week, and we talked about literally this, that verse dealt with the attitudes in our talk. The way we have in our heart, our attitudes and our talk. Now what we're going to do when we pick up verses 15 all the way through to 21, we are going to see that this verse of Scripture covers our actions and our walk. So I want you to see that. Now if you got, if you like to write in your Bible, um, just put down there right by verse 14. It deals with our attitude and our talk. Remember the verse of Scripture. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now we're talking about literally cursing out of the mouth. Now not a curse words, but cursing of judgment. Wanting God to do something bad to somebody else. Now this is talking about our attitudes and our talk. Did you know this? This really hits home to me in my own heart. This hits me where I live. That what is on the inside usually comes out. And, and I've, I've learned that in my own life. That, that what happens when I'm squeezed. 
And, and so here I want you to see that this verse of Scripture is not dealing with our attitudes and our talk. It is dealing with our actions and our walk. So we're literally going to see how to put verses four, verse 14 into place. So let's look at it. And I want to give you some, some thoughts today out of this. And so look at verse number 15. As we just continue to, to just go through here, it says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your revenge, uh, never take, uh, take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him drink. For if in doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, as we get to this point right here, we are going to see that this is contrary to our culture. All right? I got a little pushback last week from the message. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And I felt, I just felt a, a, a sense of pushback of people going, Now, preacher, I, I like those warm and fuzzy sermons where God loves everybody. I don't, want to, I don't want to know how to... Now, if I got pushed back, I'm going to get blowback today. All right? Because this, this is tough. This is tough. Will Rogers said... I mean, I love Will Rogers. He is one of my favorite people to hear, to, to uh, watch, and even to, to, to read. If you ever get it, uh, Rogerisms. Get it. It's a great little book. But Will Rogers said, The more I know about and the more I'm around human beings, the more I love my dog. My pastor used to say, he used to say, the best thing about ministry is people. And the worst thing about ministry is people. I got to throw this out there because I've just grown to love this woman. Jenny Kent said, her pastor said, the best thing about VBS, or the, wor the worst thing about VBS was the kids. You know, VBS would be great without the kids. And, you know, I think that sometimes people are our problem, aren't they? People can get in under our skin. And, and, and relationships can crumble. And, and I think that what we do in, in our lives, in human nature, we want to retaliate. And if there's ever a message that I'm preaching to you and to me this morning, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing finger at you and three are coming back with me. I told you when I started this message series, and matter of fact, I told uh, several people around here that this was going to be a really tough uh, message series for me. Because when we are hurt, when we are hurt, we tend to want to retaliate. When our relationships maybe have a rupture in them, what do we do? What do we do? Well, I want to give you eight relationship remedies today to help repair those ruptures. And they're found right here in God's Word. Romans chapter 12. So as you're looking at Romans chapter 12, verses 50, we're just going to just simply follow through all the way down. So we're going to look at these this morning. I want to give you remedy number one. It's found in verse 15. Let's look at it together. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Well, there it is right there. Remedy number one, if you and I want to repair some relationship ruptures in our lives, if we're wanting to get past our past, how many of you have trouble getting past your past? Anybody? just always there, isn't it? And it just always seems to creep up. I know in my life it is always that way. And it always ne never seems, the devil loves to throw your past up at you. And I love the old state, I saw it on the church sign several, several months ago, when the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. I like that. But I, 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 I believe that. But I think that one, the first remedy here is, is Paul gives us this. Remember verse 14, don't forget verse 14. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Now, let's look at the transition as he makes here. He says that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice, and we are to weep with those who weep. So the first remedy, relational remedy, so to speak, is to empathize with the emotions of others. Do you know what that means? 
That literally means that we enter into an incarnate, an, an, uh, an incarnational relationship with them. We are literally invited in. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Now, I want you to think about this. Don't answer it out loud, but I want you to think about it. Which one is harder? To rejoice with somebody who rejoices or to weep with somebody who weeps? Now, before you answer, think. Think. What would you say if somebody won a million dollars or inherited a million dollars? Your friend, your neighbor, somebody? Number one, you'd want to be make sure that you're in their will. I will be honest with you. I think for most of us, the hardest thing is to enter into rejoice with somebody who rejoices. Because we tend to want to weep with people. We're okay with that. And, 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 and when we go into that, I think there's a struggle in that because a lot of times what we do is, is, is we want to make sure that if they are hurting, if I'm hurting, they can be hurting too. You know, and, and that's, that's where we enter in. But look what Paul says in verse, I mean, look at the first part of verse 15. It says, and notice how he starts off in verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. We are to be happy. Two writers had a war going on. They hated each other. And they were trying, one writer was trying to uh, outdo the next. There was just so much animosity. Well, the one writer had released a book and it became an instant bestseller. And so they were at a party together and there was no doubt that everybody knew that these two just couldn't stand each other. So the first guy just kind of being, you know, wanted to congratulate the, the, the writer because he had gotten his book published and it became that bestseller. So he walked up and he said, you know, he said, I bought your book the other day and I read it. It's not half bad. Who wrote it for you? Well, the first writer was kind of taken aback with it, but he thanked him for the compliment. And he said, well, who read it to you? <laughs> you know, I think a lot of times we have a tough time with rejoicing with somebody who rejoices. Now, the weeping part, we go into that. I want you to see this. Ver, uh, pro, just, just jot these verses of Scripture down. I'm going to refer to a lot of verses of Scripture this morning. Just jot them down. We're not going to be able to turn to them. But Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 5 says this. He who mocks the poor shows contempt for their maker. Whoever gloats over disaster will not go unpunished. That's a, that, that is a startling contrast into our society. Not only that, I believe that if we're going to enter into somebody's rejoicement, then we need to literally put aside jealousy. And jealousy is a problem. You know, we, we see somebody else that is, that, is, that is getting blessed, so to speak. And we go, well, why can't I be that blessed? Or why can't I enter into that? If we're going to enter into that kind of a face, when it comes to rejoicing with somebody else, we've got to put aside jealousy. And listen to this. When we enter somebody's pain we've got to put aside the judgment a lot of times we won't we think that how many of you that now don't raise your hand on this all right because i i know i mean i know i don't have to take a a poll this morning i know when you when something bad has happened to somebody the first thing we want to do is go mm, god's getting them god's taking care of them or we secretly say well you know what they get what they deserve so listen to what Paul says, rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. We literally are pulled in to that rejoicement. We are literally pulled in to their weeping. Listen to what 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25 and 26 says. It says, um, so, that, so that there should be no divisions in the body, but that its parts should be, have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers... Every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Do you know the problem in most churches is that we're jealous of each other? We are the body of Christ. Can I, can I say this? If something good happens to you, I should rejoice because it should, if that same good is happening to me because we're part of one body. If I hurt, you hurt. If you hurt, I hurt. That's what the Bible's all about. Little boy, little boy was in the yard playing, and his mama had told him about the next door neighbor, an older gentleman who had just lost his wife to cancer, a battle with cancer. And uh, so the little boy was playing in the backyard, and he just heard this sobbing. And he looked over the fence, and the old man was just sitting there in a chair 
and his wife sat right beside him and that chair was empty and his, that, that man was just weeping just sobbing so the little boy ran over climbed the fence walked up and crawled up into the old man's lap well the boy came home and he said the mother said Johnny he said what, what was going on and, and, and what did you do how did you make him feel better he said I just helped him cry you know I, I think that there are some times that we just need to help somebody cry that we just need to rejoice when somebody rejoices but we also need to weep we also need to enter into their their sadness and and I I'm gonna tell you this I'm gonna warn you about this too sometimes entering into somebody's grief and sadness is better done when you keep your mouth shut <laughs> I, I love the, the the person who said that it is by far better to let people think that you're a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt Job's friends did a really good job of entering into him and crying with him and weeping for him until they opened their mouth to give him some suggestions. A lot of times what we need to do is we just need to be there. We just need to sit there. We need to empathize with others' emotions. So that's, that's remedy number one. Let me give you number two. Let me give you number two. Seek harmony through humility. All right? That's found in verse 16. Look at verse 16. We're just kind of following on through here. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Now, what is he talking about there? The only way that you and I can ever have harmony, whether it be in the church of God, whether it be in your family, wherever it is, it is a word called humility. There is no harmony apart from humility. You notice that. Because if there is not a sense of humility, then there's always going to be somebody that wants a leg up. There's always going to be somebody that's going to try to do something to undermine somebody else so that they can get to the top. This society, this is totally contrary. Like I said, this message today is contrary. This whole sermon series has been contrary to our popular culture. The popular culture says it doesn't matter who you stand on to get to the top just as long as you get to the top. It don't matter what you do to get there just as long as you get there. And when you get there, it's hard to stay there, right? Because you have swindled and gotten all the way up to the top and you've stepped on a lot of people. And, and God's Word says that we are to do this with humility. That we are not only to... And, and I love how the things just fit together like a puzzle. Paul says we rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep. How can you do that? You can only do that if you have a sense of of humility there must be humility in verse 16 listen to what the, the I want to kind of share it out of the Greek uh, word it says be of the same mind toward one another that word literally means harmony we are to live in harmony with one another we're to be of the same mind the word harmony means that we we think the same way now it doesn't mean that we always we like the same things. there are some of you that like food and that others don't and there's some some of you that that like to do things that others don't there's some of you I mean if we got around here and I asked you what's fate what's, what is the greatest movie of all time I would probably get as many different answers as there are people here and 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 we all have different likes and dislikes we have different things that we like to do and 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 that's what makes the world go around but by and large, what I'm talking about with harmony is that we are of the same mind because our mind, as Paul says, is the mind of Christ. There's a difference there. When we rejoice with somebody and when we weep with somebody, our mind needs to be dwelt in harmony. That's where churches have problems. When we see a different... I, I, years ago, and it's still somewhat rampant today, but not as bad, thank God, but there was worship wars. The, the people that wanted contemporary worship and those that wanted traditional worship. A little church up the street from us decided that they were going to go to two services, which was kind of odd because they had 100 people in a 300-seat sanctuary. And I thought, why do you want to go to two services? Well, because we're, the early service is going to be the traditional service and the 1030 service was going to be the contemporary service. 
Do you know what happened? I, I, I did. I, I was flat honest. We met. We ate. We ate lunch together. He told me what he was going to do and said, I want you to pray for me, brother. And I just smiled. And he said, why are you smiling? I said, I don't mind taking your people. They're, they're welcome here. Just tell them that. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, when you split your church, just tell them they're welcome at my church. And that's exactly what happened. Guess what happened? The senior adults began to get, come in the early service, and the young folks began to come in the later service. And before you know it, the church was split, and that's the way it began. And, and, and I, I, that's, this harmony is so critical in acts chapter 2 listen what the bible says it says that the early the disciples were all of one accord they were together do you know why the church of jesus christ exploded yes it was the holy spirit of god but those men and those women were together in one mind in one accord can i tell you this when summit gets together in one mind in one accord with the holy spirit as it's as our guide there is nothing that's going to stop us we're going to be able to impact this world. We're going to be able to impact Loganville. We're going, to be imp we're going to be able to impact our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. All, all it takes is us to be together. All it takes is harmony. And, and that is so vitally important. 1 Corinthians, put this down, 1 Corinthians 1.10. Don't look it up. Don't look it up. I'm going, to give you the lazy, I'm going to give you the lazy man's version this morning. All right, I'm not going to have you flipping scriptures. But listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and there be no division among you, but you be made complete in the same mind and the same judgment. Do you hear that? The same judgment. What does that mean? That means that we are united. There is no division. The devil loves to divide. Jesus loves to unite. There's a difference there. We must live in harmony with each other. If you're, a ha if you're haughty, it's going to be really hard for anybody to get along with you. That's what Paul says. If you have a, 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 an arrogant spirit, it's going to be hard for, for others to get along with you. You know, I want you to look around this room this morning. I can promise you in a church this size that there's probably a heartache on every row. There's probably a heartache on every, every row, every pew. Every row in this church, somebody's hurting. Somebody is dealing with something that they are having a trouble with, that they're having problems with, that they're trying to get past. Because, listen, when you look at somebody else, there is no caste system. There is no uh, caste system in Christianity. There is, there is no system of, well, this person's a higher Christian than this person is. No. The bottom line is it's, the ground is all level at the foot of the cross. And, and so here's the thing. You're not a super saint. I'm not a super saint. I'm not a super Christian. I'm not a bit more of a Christian than you are. We are all Christians. And we are all bought with the same blood that Jesus shed. And, and so when you see that, why in the world can't we get together? Why is a church... And, and I, somebody asked me this week when I was on vacation. Somebody asked me, found out that when people find out you're a preacher... I mean, it just, you get all kinds of questions, all kinds of things. You know, you're walking down the beach, and you start to talking to somebody, and, they, you know, they find out you're a preacher, and they start hiding what they're drinking. <laughs> Guy's smoking a cigar, and I'm talking with him. What do you do for a living? Ah, I'm a preacher. Puts it behind here. I said, fella, your rear end's on fire. <laughs> But we were talking. This guy looked at me. He said, what do you think is the problem of the church today? I mean, why are we not making any impact? Why are we not making any inroads through uh, uh, politics or all of these other things? And I just looked at him and I said, it's simply because we're not united on anything. We're not united. I mean, you see the, 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 the splinters, not even, I don't have to go to the Methodist. The, the Presbyterian. Man, I would love to criticize the Methodist and Presbyterian, but I can't because I'm not one. But I am a Southern Baptist, and I'm going to tell you this right now. The things in our society and the things in our nation would drastically be different if you and I could get on the same page. If, I, if we as a Southern Baptist Convention could get on the same page, 
And, and I'm telling you, the right page is the one that has that Jesus is on. And if we can get to that, I am telling you, things would be drastically different. And, and so I want you to see the, the tense of this, the, 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 the tense of what Paul is saying. This is not in past tense. This is in a present tense. So this is what Paul is saying. He's saying, do not, do not have the habit of being haughty. We have a habit, don't we? It is all about me. And, and, and we're in a me, me driven society. So we enter the emotions of others, but we do it with a humble spirit. And let me give you remedy number three. Remedy number three is that we resist repaying wrong. Look at verse 17. Look what he says Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. You see, the first part of verse 7 is a warning against what comes naturally to most of us. If somebody hits you, what are you going to do? No, I'm going to hit them back. That's just all there is to it. That's all there is to it. I'm going to hit you back. And you know what happens? And we're going to get to this in a minute. What really happens, it happens in marriages all the time. It happens in mine. Not hitting. But what we do is uh, we'll, we'll verbally, she'll verbally shoot a slingshot rock over at me. And I'll take my pellet gun and, and I'll pop it back at her. And she'll load up her 22 and she'll shoot it at me. Then I get the 357 out. And before long, there's an all out nuclear war. And it all started with a rock being slung over. You see where I'm going with that? When we repay, what we tend to do is we tend to, you know what, you hit me. I'm, by golly, I'm going to hit you back, and I'm going to hit you hard. And then you're going to hit me back and hit me harder. And see, the point is, is that it never ends. So this is what Paul says. Paul says, never repay evil for evil. Never repay it back. Little boy, little mama was cleaning the kitchen up, and she heard her little boy screaming from the other room. Ah! The mother thought, oh, my goodness, this little two-year-old sister's in there. What could have been going on? Just screaming, blood curdling screaming. So she runs in there. And the little two-year-old girl has her son by the hair. And she's pulling. And he's screaming. And she lets go. He says, all right, sweetheart, let go. And the little boy just had tears in his eyes. And he's screaming. And he said, Mom, she hurt. And Mama said, she's just two years old. She doesn't understand that that hurts you. So the mama walked out. Then about three minutes later, she hears a blood-curdling scream. And it's the little girl. And then she rushes in. And the little boy says, she knows now. That's what we want to do. We want to repay evil for evil. You do to me, I'm going to do it to you. And I'm going to do it with more force. Listen to what 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says. Do not repay evil for evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because this is what you you were called. Did you hear that? We are called to bless. Again, Romans chapter 12 and verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do you see where we're going with this? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 15. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and everyone else. My pastor, who passed away a couple of months ago, he just meant a lot to me, but he gave me... Uh, and I've got it in my Bible, one of my Bibles in my office. He gave me, he, he gave me some suggestions or reasons why we should not repay for wrong. I want you to jot these down, all right? Write them down. The, these are great to have. Put it, in a, put it in the margin of your Bible. If you've got one of those pages in the back, a blank page, put it somewhere. This is why we should not repay evil for evil or repay a wrong. Number one, it always causes the conflict to escalate always always if you retaliate you can be rest assured that it's going to cause the conflict to escalate so it's going to cause and there's a verse of scripture for that if you want it proverbs chapter 30 and verse 33 for as churning of the milk produces butter and the twisting of the nose produces blood so stirring up anger produces strife think about it that's a great verse of scripture when it comes 
to retaliation. Number two, retaliation is usually excessive. You know what that means? That means when somebody, when you, when you pay back, you do it with interest. You want to make sure that they are hurt as bad as you are and even more than that. So retaliation, number one, always causes the conflict to escalate. Number two, it retaliate usually is, retaliation usually is excessive. And listen to this. You ready for this one? I want to get you. Make sure, make sure you got that pencil ready. You ready? I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. It ruins our witness. It ruins our witness. Retaliation always ruins our witness. Did you know that people are looking at you? A couple weeks ago, we were in youth camp. And I started off the youth camp by tell, asking the kids and telling these young people, did you know that somebody is watching you? All the time, somebody is watching you. Now, that doesn't mean I want you to be scared. And some people are going to say, yeah, big brother's watching. Yeah, yeah. We got satellites all over the place. Somebody's watching. But I'm going to tell you something else. There is somebody that is watching you and is going to watch how you react to a situation. There's always somebody that watch. Folks, you can't always stop people from hurting you, but you don't have to hate them back. You don't have to hurt them back. You can't, you can't, you cannot, you, the only person you're in charge of is you. You, you are in charge of you. And, and so we tend uh, to, to let all kinds of, but people say, well, Brother Jason, now wait a minute, if I forgive, there's a lot of dangers involved in forgiveness. Yeah, there is. There is. That's why it's hard to do. Because here we want them to hurt. We want them to pay. We want them to know how bad. How many of you have ever said that? Somebody has hurt you and you go, I wonder if they know how bad I'm hurt. You ever said that before? And, and you know what? The bottom line is this. It's not our job to fool with it. It's not our job to worry about it. I can tell you for months and months, I spent in the back of my mind, I spent thinking, all right, how in the world can I retaliate? How in the world can I let these people know how bad they hurt me? And I'm going to tell you what that does. You live in the past. You'll never get... Paul says this, forgetting those things that lie behind me, I press onward. I press forward to what lies ahead. You hear that? we got to forget what is behind us, and we've got to move forward. And the only way we're going to do that is by letting the past go. Letting things go. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 22 says this. Do not say I will pay back, wrong, uh, pay back for this wrong. Wait for the Lord and he will deliver you. Did you hear that? Wait for the Lord and he will deliver you. Now, C.S. Lewis gave this. I love this right here. C.S. Lewis said, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? I love that. That is a great quote. We buried the hatchet. I don't know how many of you, how many of you like country music? I, I, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Those of you that don't, I'm going to pray for your souls. All right. Garth Brooks wrote a song years ago, and in his song, I'm not going to try to sing it, but in his song, he said this. Now, I don't know where you can come and hear a sermon and hear Garth Brooks in the middle of it. But you're going to hear one today. Here's what Garth Brooks said. Garth Brooks said, We bury the hatchet, but leave the handle sticking out. We're always digging up things we should forget about. We do, don't we? Oh, well, let's just bury the hatchet. But we tend to bury the hatchet with the handle sticking out just in case I need to come back and whack you over the head with it. That's what we want to do. And, and so the, the bottom line is this, is that we've got to forget that. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Listen to what it says. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Oh, did anybody else feel that? <laughs> I did. We read the verse. We read that. We, you know what? I, it's like that lady <laughs> at my other church. I'd get out preaching a sermon, preaching a message, and she'd walk out the door and she'd go, man, preacher, you gave it to them today. I can always say I gave it to you today. We read the Bible and we go, man, that must be for somebody else. Woo, it ain't for me, though. Love keeps no record of wrong. How many of us here, well, you did this and you did that. You ever get in an argument with your wife or your, your husband? You ever get in an argument with them? And you start bringing up junk that they did 15 years ago? Do you remember when you did this? No? No? I told my wife one night, she, I said, how can you just, she gets still and goes to sleep. I mean, still. I mean, you know, literally, she just lays down and goes, I say, how do you do that? She says, a sign of clear conscience. No, folks, it's just a bad memory. It's a bad memory. 
You know, listen, we want to keep records of wrongs. We want to, oh, you did this to me, I did this to you. But listen at this. Love keeps no records of wrong. Let me ask you this question that I had to ask me this. Ask myself this. You know, they say that, you know, I don't know how many of you talk to yourself. They say that, they say that you know, you're not insane if you talk to yourself. You're only insane if you answer yourself back. I'm insane. <laughs> I will talk to myself all the time. On the lawnmower, I mean, I'm, I'm out there, I'm talking to myself. People look, What's, who's he talking to? He must be talking to the Lord. No, I'm just talking to me. Number one, it's you the only person that listens to me. But here, here, here's, listen to this. How, how, who, is it, who is it that you need to let go of? Who is it that you need to just kind of say, you know what? I got to let this go. Who is it right now? Get that person in your mind. Get that situation in your mind. Let me give you remedy number four. Remedy number four. It's found in verse number 17. Realize that it's always right to do what's right. Isn't that neat? It's always right to do what's right. Look at verse 17. Never pay back evil for evil. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Do you see that? You know where I got that from? That word, right? <laughs> so there, there it is right there. Realize that it's always right to do what is right. It is, this verse is so easy, easy to misunderstand. It is not our job to make everybody happy. It is not our job to make everybody happy. It is our job to live a holy life and to do what is right. That's our job. Now, here's where the problem comes in. Look what he says. in ver I, want you to, I want you to look at it. Let's look at this verse. Never repay back evil for evil uh, to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. I think that we need to be very careful. Some of your versions may say careful. That word there means literally. How many of you sit down and you, you think ahead of time on how you will react to a situation? We need to. We need to. If something happens here, how am I going to respond and how am I going to react? Too many times we just shoot from the hip. Well, I'll just take it as it goes. Don't do that. Don't do that. You need to think ahead. If this happens, what am I going to do? If this happens, how am I going to show what is right? I've got to do what's right. And folks, doing what's right is never wrong. And I don't care if you are here in this church or out there in our community. Doing what's right is always right. The word right here means, listen, in the Greek text means beautiful or precious. Isn't that neat? Isn't that neat? So you can actually say in verse 17, never repay back evil for evil. Respect what is beautiful and precious. What is that that's beautiful and precious? It's that which is right. It's that which is right. When we ponder how precious God is to us, then people will notice around us and give him the glory. You hear what, you know what, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that, by, uh, that you will, uh, people will see your deeds and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's what we're to do. When somebody does something negative to you and you repay them with a positive you better believe something's going to You better believe that there is going to be uh, people going to stand up and take notice on that. And, and so that is so important. Live so that we can do what's right. All right, let me give you number five. Let me give you number five. You ready for this one? Be at peace. Be at peace if possible. Now, I did put that if possible there because... You are not responsible for somebody else. You are responsible for you, Paul says it. Look at it right here in verse 18. If possible. Do you see that, if possible? Boy, that's underlined in my Bible. Now, that does not mean that you go, well, Paul says that it might not be possible, so therefore I ain't going to try. That's not what that means. If possible. Look at that. If possible, so far as it depends on you. You know what? You are responsible for you. You are not responsible for somebody else. I'm not responsible. If, 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 if me and, and, and Joe are in an argument here, I'm not responsible for Joe. I'm responsible for me. And I'm responsible for doing what I can do to keep the peace. Don't worry, me and Joe are not. But you see where I'm going with this. I'm not responsible for how he responds, but I am responsible for me. 
And, and so Paul says right here, the key to this is that we do everything, and write this down, we do everything possible to keep the peace. Now, that's, that's, that's where it kind of hits us where we live. Because how many of us are doing everything in our power and possible to keep the peace? A lot of times we don't. Notice that word, if possible, and as it depends on you. This literally means as far as you're concerned. If God were to look at you and God were to take mine and Joe's feud and set it right here and say, okay, God looks at me and goes, all right, you've done everything you could to keep peace. Yes, I have. Could you say that? Could you say that you've done everything in your, po in your power? Here are some questions that I want, to, I want you to kind of think on when, when it comes to peacemaking, all right? Here they are. Have you accepted your part of the breakdown of peace? Have you? Number two, are you willing to make right the wrongs that you may have done? You ever heard an apology like this? If I've done anything to offend you, I apologize. Just don't apologize you got to say something. No, I'm sorry I did that. If I did anything to offend you, that's saying like this. Well, I know I hadn't done anything, but if you perceived what I said as being wrong, then, you know, okay, I apologize. No, no. Have you accepted it? Number two, are you willing to make it right? Number three, have you forgiven any wrong that has been done to you? I'm going to tell you, unforgiveness will destroy all grounds for peacemaking. I don't care if it's between a husband and a wife. I don't care if it's between children. I don't care if it's between a co-worker, whoever the case may be. Unforgiveness will absolutely destroy it. Are you doing your part to be at peace? Are you doing your part to, to be at peace? I, <laughs> I heard a story about two brothers that were in a fight. They went to the rabbi. They went to the rabbi and said, Rabbi, we just can't get past this. I hate him and he hates me and it's mutual. And the rabbi said, okay. He said, he, he mediated between them. He even got them to the point where they shook hands and hugged them. Well, as they were walking out the door, the rabbi said, I want you to make a New Year's wish. So the first brother looked over there at him, his brother, and he goes, brother, I wish for you what you're wishing for me right now. And that brother threw up his hand and said, there he goes again, rabbi. We can't get along. There he goes again. You see, I, I think a lot of times what we do is, is, is we want to do we want to make sure that, that we are, they hurt. And, and then what we want to make sure is we want to make for sure that, that we hold on. And peace is not about the other person. Peace is about you. What have you done to, for peace? You, we're so concerned about somebody else. We've got to understand that peace, the, what he's talking about here. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse, I love this. 2 Corinthians 3.11. Just jot that verse of Scripture down. Finally, brethren, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. You hear that? Do you know how Paul closed a lot of his, message, his letters? Grace and peace. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that before, grace and peace. Have you ever heard it said this, peace and grace? Well, it just don't sound right, does it? You know why? Because there is absolutely no peace apart from the grace of God. There's no peace. Maybe, some, maybe, maybe somebody here today, you're sitting there and you're going, you know what? I don't understand any of that. It's because you've never experienced the grace of God in your life. The grace that only Christ can bring. Folks, you can't get it to peel. You can't get it in liquid form. You can't get it in a drug. You can't get it in, in a relationship, a human relationship. The only way that you will ever experience perfect peace in your life is through the blood of Jesus Christ. You know him. Do you know him? Do you know him? You ever heard the term, it takes two to tango? I've rewrote that term. It takes two to tangle. We can absolutely, hey, you may look and say, well, that's all that person's fault. Let me tell you, there's two sides to every coin. And there's two sides to that story. Let me give you remedy number six. Let me give you remedy number six. And this is probably the toughest of all of the remedies 
Remedy number six is this, is we have got to relinquish revenge to God. We've got to relinquish revenge to God. Look at verse number 19. Never take your own revenge. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that never take your own revenge because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It's God's. And, and let me tell you what you do. What you do when you decide to take revenge and you decide to issue out the punishment, you are saying, God, you're not doing a good enough job. I can do better. You know one thing I learned that really set my spirit free is there is a God and I am not he. I am not him. And I thank God every day there is a God and you're not him. Because I am telling you, if the, I mean, we, I could just see it. If we were God, and, we, and I know if I was God, driving around these streets, there'd just be piles of ashes everywhere. There are pet peeves that you have that you would just go, that? I mean, I'd just turn people into frogs. I'd just do that. But what we do when we take the judgment is we're saying, God, I am putting myself in your place. And be careful when you do that because listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says that God will have no other gods before him. And let me tell you, be careful what you put ahead of God. It's happened in my life. I know it's happened in yours as well. Warren Wiersbe said this, God alone can judge fairly. We do not know all the variables, and we can't measure anyone else's heart. God maintains the moral order, not us. How in the world can I issue out judgment when I am just as sinful as you? Only a right, just, and holy God can do that. Only God can do that. And you know what? It's got to be done, done God's way. And here, you hear this out. Write this down. In his way, in his time. Not in yours. God, God's timing is always perfect. He is he's seldom early. Never late. Always right on time. And that's God's plan. And that's God's way. So, let me, uh, let, me, let, me give you, let me give you number seven. Let me give you number seven. Um, you know, I think about the relinqu relinquishing revenge to God and, and doing what is right. Did you know this? It is never a good idea to repay evil for evil. And, and I got to think about this the other day. It is never right to bomb abortion clinics. I, I'm sorry, it's just not right. It is not right to have hatred built up in your heart for homosexuals. It is not right to hate, hate, hate or, or, or to bash another political party. It's our job to love and let God do the rest of it. And I'm telling you, if we will do that, stand for what's right. I didn't mean, hey, I'm not saying put your head in the sand like an ostrich. Because the Christians have done that too long. We stand for what we believe in. But I'm going to tell you what. Stand up for what you believe in and let God do the battling. We tend to stand up and go, you know what, I'm going to fight. I want, you to, I want you to listen to this verse of Scripture. Put on the full armor of God so that you may stand against the, the wiles of the devil. Where in that verse of Scripture does it tell us to fight? Nowhere. And... Let me tell you this. The whole armor of God is put on. He talks about the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. He talks about having our feet shod with the gospel of peace. And we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Do you know that there is only one part of the body that's not covered up? The backside. You know why? Because we are to stand. You're not to sit. You're not to run. You're not to cower down, tuck your tail between your legs and run off. You are to stand, but listen and listen to me good. Let God do the fighting for us. Let him do the battling. Now, let me give you this one. Number seven. Do good to those who do you wrong. Look at verse 20. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. This is so counterculture. 
that many of us, when I just said that, you just went. <gasps> Here's the thing. We are to do good. We are to do good to those who do us wrong. Why? Because it shows who we serve. It shows who lives inside of us. I want you to turn with me in your Bible. Keep a Bible marker. Go to the book of Exodus. Go to the book of Exodus, chapter number uh, 23. And uh, I want to pull a verse of Scripture out of the, out of the Old Testament. I, you know, I always like to, even if I'm preaching from the New Testament, I always like to go back to the Old Testament, pull it together. Because I, 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 get, so tired, I get so frustrated when I hear people say, well, I'll preach the Old Testament, then I'll preach the New Testament. Folks, you can't see the New Testament without looking at it through the eyes of the Old Testament. It's all one book, okay? And, and so it's not like that, well, the Old Testament is here, then we have a stop, and then, no, look at, look at this, look at this. I want you to see how this, how, how this right here, this verse of Scripture goes right along. Exodus chapter 23, and starting with verse number 4. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey wandering away, you shall surely return it to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying helpless under its load, you shall refrain from leaving it to him. You shall surely release it with him. What is that all about? Do you not see what he's talking about? What he's literally talking about here in these verses of Scripture is that Christianity goes beyond paying back evil for evil. It goes to benevolence. What we do is we do good for people. We are supposed to do good for people. Vance Havner said, Christianity does not destroy its enemies by violence, but it converts them by love. I love that. I'm going to say that again. That was a good one. Christianity does not destroy its enemies by violence, but it converts them by love. I'm going to tell you something right now. You want to see a situation melt away? You want to see a heart of stone melt away? You want to see sometimes hatred turn to love? Then you do good for those who hurt you. And I promise you what happens is you'll see that heart melt away. Not every time. Not every time. But let me tell you, here's the thing. Well, what if they don't change? That's God's deal. That's their deal. But as far as I stand right here, I stand clean. I can stand and I can say I've done all I can do. Let me give you the eighth one. Let me close with this one. Overcome evil by doing, uh, by doing what's good. Overcome evil by going with the good. I like that. Going with the good. How do we do that? Look at verse 21. Go back to, to, to Romans uh, chapter 12. Now listen to, what, listen to what 21 says. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do you see that? This verse literally summarizes the whole chapter of Romans. It just summarizes everything. And, and listen, this is again in the present tense. What Paul is saying here is stop being overcome by evil. I saw something in the last few weeks. Supreme Court rulings. People wanting to destroy things and flags coming down and all that kind of stuff. And, and I feel, you know... Part of me, you're like me, right? Part of you saw the news and you're like going, Ugh! and you got mad and, and the hackle just came up on the back of you. Now you just got mad. And then I thought about this. I thought about one of my favorite people in all of history, Martin Luther King Jr. Here's what Martin Luther King Jr. said. Martin Luther King Jr. said, I refuse to hate. Because hate is a heavy burden. I try love. Did you know that if we were to put on love, things would be different? People make a ruling. People do things. And we, hey, I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying any of that. But what I'm saying is our reaction can be worse than a Supreme Court ruling. I'm saying that if we turn we are to hate the sin, but we are to love the sin. I'm going to tell you this right now, and I'm going to tell you from the bottom of my heart. Here it is. It's laid out there. 
I am so glad. Years ago, somebody hated my sin. Love me. Because I'm going to tell you right here, if you've ever done anything wrong in your life, if you've ever committed one sin in your life, it took just as much blood and the same amount of blood to cover your sin as it did a homosexual, as it did a drunkard, as it did an adulterer, as it did anybody else. So here's how we overcome evil. By going with the Spirit. Here's my question to you today. What do you need to do to move past your past? What do you need to do? Empathize with other people's emotions, quit being a, a you know, put on humility, you know, quit quit having a, a haughty spirit. Are you trying to repay? Are you trying to hit them harder than they hit you? When's it gonna stop? I'll tell you. My uncle, <laughs> probably one of the wisest men I've ever known. Here's what he told me one time. Such an easy thing. You've heard it. Catch more flies with honey than you can be. Never understood that until you start thinking about that. You want to impact? Well, I want to impact. I'll tell you right now, impact starts right here. Right with you. I want you to bow your head with me this morning. I don't know what this message, uh, what, what you need, how you need to respond to this message, but I do know this. If you're in the same boat that I am, and I'm not a waging gambling man, but I would bet that we probably are in the same boat. If you're in the same boat that I'm in, there's some things that we need to relinquish. There's some things that we need. Thank you for joining us today. We want you to know that you are always welcome at the summit. We are located on Highway 81 south of Loganville. Sunday school is at 9 a.m. and worship is at 10.30 a.m. For more information, you can visit our website at thesummitchurch.com.